In this model, we're going to look at how we can evaluate the performance of a classifier. This might sound kind of obvious. Why don't you just take an evaluation set and calculate the proportion of points that are assigned to the correct class? And you can actually do that. That's called the model accuracy. But what we'll see is that that doesn't always give a good indication of how well a model performs on the classes that you're actually interested in. So we're specifically going to look at how model precision, recall, and if one score can give you a better idea of what the model is actually doing. So the most obvious metric to use when you're doing classification is the classification accuracy. So let's just formalize that. When we're doing binary classification, then what we can do is that we predict the class uh, is equal to, let's say, 1 if our model's output is above 0 0.5 and the output is equal to 0, the output prediction, if the model output is less than 0 0.5, greater than or equal to 0 0.5. That's binary classification. When we're doing multi-class classification, then the model output is going to be, let's make that arg max over our different classes. So from little k is equal to one up to big K of f k our input given our parameters. So here in this case, we're basically looking at the you can think of it as scores for the different classes and we're outputting the class with the maximum score and if you do that if you write it out in this formal way then the accuracy on a test set can be calculated as um, basically summing up the indicator function over your n test points and what you're doing is you're checking the ground truth label is that equal to the prediction if that is the case, then this returns 1, and we're adding up a 1. If that's not the case, then we don't get credit for that, so we're adding up a 0. This is just a, you know, a mathematical way of writing the fraction of test points that are assigned the correct class, according to my model. Very often, we would express accuracy as a percentage. The error would just be 1 minus the accuracy, and again, we can express that as a percentage and maybe talk about the error rate. Both accuracy and error, in many cases, are easy ways to summarize and compare system performance. But unfortunately, it can also be skewed, and that very often happens when we have one class or a few classes that occurs lot more often than other classes, then accuracy is implicitly looking at those classes more than some other classes. And that can be particularly um, problematic if um, we're very interested in a specific class, and maybe that's not the most common class in our test data. So for instance, in binary classification, we might have that the positive class uh, is, a, is very rare, but we're actually the most interested in detecting when that positive class occurs. We might actually even be okay with accidentally classifying something that is really a negative and classifying that as a positive, as long as all the true positive cases are detected by our model. In other cases, you might have the opposite situation where you might want to be absolutely sure that when you make a positive prediction, that the thing that you're predicting as positive is actually a positive. And you would do that even at the cost of accidentally missing some positive cases. The problem is that accuracy and error measures the importance of classes equally. Um, and we therefore need some other metrics um, to more carefully break down system performance. We're now going to look at some of these more finer grained metrics. And many of these metrics make use of something called a confusion matrix. So let me quickly just explain what that is. A confusion matrix on some set basically keeps track of the types of mistakes and correct predictions that we make. So let's quickly just look at this. Some inputs might actually be negative, and our binary classifier might correctly classify these inputs as negative. That's called a true negative. In other cases, we might mess up, and something that is a negative might be predicted as a positive. 
and that's called a false positive because we predicted this thing to be positive. Okay, in other cases, we might have a positive class and this is an actual positive input and our model might also correctly predict that this thing is positive. That's called a true positive. In other cases, we might mess up and our model might predict that this thing that is actually positive is actually, it, it predicts that it's negative and that's called a false negative. And the confusion matrix in each of these four cells, you basically write down the number of points that are true negatives, false negatives, false positives, and true positives. And based on those numbers, we're going to define these more finer grained metrics. So let's pretend we're building a cancer classification system. This is a system that takes some input and classifies whether a patient has cancer or not. And what we do is we have some validation data where we know whether someone actually has cancer or not. And we pass all of those data through our classifier and we keep track of the number of true negatives, false negatives, false positives, and true positives based on the prediction of our model and comparing that to the actual label of the data. The first metric that we look at is precision. So here the question is, of the items classified as being positive, what fraction is actually positive? For our cancer example, of the patients predicted to have cancer, of those patients predicted to have cancer, how many actually do? So what we're doing is we're only looking at this row in the data set. And we're asking of those predicted as true, how many of them are actually true? So we can write that out in this way. So precision is equal to the number of true positives divided by the number of predicted positives. And from the table, what we can do is we can see that we're taking the true positives and we're dividing that by the number of false positives plus the number of true positives. Recall asks, of the items that are actually positive, what fraction did we correctly predict as being positive? So uh, in our cancer example, we're asking of all the patients actually having cancer, how many of them did we correctly classify as having cancer? That means that we're looking at this um, column in the uh, confusion matrix. We're looking at patients that actually have cancer and we're asking how many of them did we correctly detect? So your recall is equal to the number of uh, true positives divided by the number of actual positives. And using the um, terminology from the table, that means we're taking the number of true positives and we're dividing that by, let's just write it, false negatives plus true positives. So with the COVID pandemic in 2019 and 2020, uh, we of course heard a lot about the success of different tests for detecting whether someone has COVID or doesn't have COVID. And in the medical world, you would also have these idea of precision and recall, testing for different things and interested in different things, but they use a slightly different um, terminology. So recall is called uh, sensitivity. So if they say that some COVID test has a sensitivity of 95%, then that basically says, out of the actual number of people with, with COVID in your test set, 95% of the true positives will be um, correctly detected by this, by this test. There's also something else that they often report in um, the medical world, and that's called specificity. I really struggled to say this word. And specificity isn't precision exactly. Um, what this is, is it's similar to recall, but it looks at the negative cases. So it asks, of all the items that are actually negative, which fraction did we correctly predict as being negative? So that's another metric that uh, you might have seen in the, in the media in, in 2020. In the machine learning world, very often we're specifically looking at precision and recall to um, gauge the performance of a system. It's still useful to have a single metric to compare, you know, model A to model B. And for that, we often use the F1 score, which is just the harmonic mean of recall and precision. Let's just quickly, just very quickly, intuitively see what F1, um, what the F1 score gives you. 
So you can really easy hack recall. And the way to hack recall is to basically just classify everything as being positive. In that case, you will get 100% recall because you're just classifying everything as positive. So everything is here. And since recall only looks at, um, at this column here, you won't have any false negatives, 100% recall. So you can also hack precision. And just as a reminder, precision hacks uh, looks at this row here and it asks out of the predictive positives out of these ones, how many are really positive. And the way to hack that is to basically just classify the one point that you're most confident about, the easiest point in your test set. You classify that thing as positive, boom, and everything else you classify as negative. So in that case, you would have a one here, you would have a zero here, and you will get one divided by one, so you'd get 100% precision. The thing is, if you hack precision, then you're going to sacrifice recall. If you hack recall, then you're going to sacrifice precision. And that's really captured in the F1 score. So even if your precision is 100% and your recall is very close to zero, then you get penalized. And vice versa, if your recall is really high, but you've got a precision that's close to zero, then you're also screwed. So we've looked at the definition of precision and recall, but let's just quickly try and get an intuition for how we will trade off these things in, a, in practical settings. So what we've basically been doing implicitly um, when we looked at binary classi classification is really to say that if our model output is larger than 0.5, then we classify the input as positive. And if the output is smaller than 0 0.5, then we classify the output as negative. But what this does is it implicitly weighs the positive and the negative classes equally. And as we've been discussing with precision and recall, we might not want that to actually happen. So to make that concrete, let's just think of two, two specific examples. So let's say we're building a system uh, which will act as a reading tutor. It's a system that um, basically prompts a child with a sentence and then asks them to read that sentence. The sentence, the spoken sentence gets recorded and then the model needs to predict whether that child read the sentence correctly or not. And if we could do this, you know, then we could um, solve a lot of the illiteracy problems in, in the world. Now, it turns out that there are actually systems like this being, being developed. Um, but the one thing that um, uh, educators have noticed is that when you tell a child that they read a sentence wrong, you need to be very, very sure that that sentence was actually read wrong, because otherwise the child can get demotivated and not actually end up using the system, which misses the whole point. So in this case, we want to have a very high precision system. That means that if we're going to predict that this thing is a mistake, which is labeled as one, if we're going to predict that it is a mistake, then we need to be very, very, very sure that um, there, there was actually a mistake. So in that case, what we might want to do is instead of predicting a mistake when the probability is larger than 0 0.5, now what we might want to do is instead maybe use, I don't know, 0 0.9 or maybe 0 0.7. But we only output um, um, saying that this was a miscue if we're very, very confident. In that case, we can basically replace the 0 0.5 with some threshold alpha, which uh, when I scribbled it here, which was 0 0.9. And we predict the output as being positive if it's um, above 0 0.9 and negative when it's below 0 0.9. That would be a high precision system. Let's look at a second example. Let's say we've developed a TB classification system. And what we want to do is we want to use this TB classification system as an early screening process in a hospital. So it's something where a patient comes in, we very quickly scan them, and then we decide based on that output from the model whether we want to refer the patient to a doctor or not. Now, in this case, it's really a first pass screen. It's cheap. Uh, we can do it quickly. And what we probably want here is that even if the model thinks that this person is just slightly um, probable to have TB, we might want to refer them to a doctor. So in this case, we might want to um, basically say, let's um, 
output true that this person has TB, even if the score is, I don't know, 0 0.3, okay? And of course, the score also changes to 0 0.3. Because in this case, we might be happy to accidentally send someone to the doctor, even though they don't have TB, because we don't want to miss anyone that actually has, has TB. So in this case, again, we can basically change the threshold um, here, alpha, and set that to 0 0.3 or maybe even 0 0.2 if we want to be really sure that anyone that has TB uh, will be um, sent to the doctor. And that implies we want a really high recall system. Now, if you have a high precision system, then you're going to sacrifice recall. If you have a high recall system, then you're going to sacrifice precision. And we've spoken about that a little bit. Let's just quickly um, see how that pans out. So if we have a high precision system, we set that threshold to be um, very, very high. Then what's going to happen is we're going to have um, we're going to only predict things as positive when we're really, really sure that they're positives. So we're going to have um, a lot of true positives and very few false positives. So this um, score here, which is true positives divided by the sum of those two, that's going to be high. But what's going to happen is if we set that threshold very, very high, then there are things that is going to be positive that we're going to miss. So we're going to classify them as negative, even though they are actually positive. So that means our false negatives will get um, a lot more. And that means that our recall, where we have false negatives here, will get lower. So now let's say we make that threshold very, very small, high recall system. Because we're uh, erring on the side of classifying things as positive, we're going to have uh, a lot of true positives, and we're going to have a very few false negatives. That gives us high recall. But there are going to be many things which is actually negative that we're now classifying as being positive. So our false positives will increase, and that will uh, bring down precision. So there's this trade-off between precision and recall. What we've done up to now is we've looked at precision, recall, and F1 score for binary classification. But these metrics can also be extended to multiple classes. Let's just look at one approach here because there's more than one way to do this. But the, the one approach that I want to mention here is that you basically calculate the precision and recall by treating each class in turn as the positive class. You keep track of the precision and recall for each of the individual classes, and then you just average them unweighted, so you don't look at how often a particular class occurs. You just basically average the different precisions and recalls. And that gives you something called macro precision or and macro recall when you average the recalls. And that's one way to get a metric that um, you can use um, on multiple classes as well.